So on this beautiful Sunday morning, welcome to everyone. <clears throat> the United Church of the Valley is committed to welcoming everyone, no exceptions. We believe that as you are beloved by God, you are beloved by all of us. And so wherever you are in your journey, we're glad that you're with us today. We're especially glad to welcome Jennifer Zecklin. Um, Jennifer co <clears throat> comes to us right now from uh, Mississippi. However, um, she actually grew, uh, ori originally came from Inland Valley, or at least previously from Inland Valley. Um, she's been worshiping with us online for the last couple months, and we are so excited to hear, um, hear from her today and get to know her better. So welcome, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> the next video you're going to watch is one that Jennifer especially wanted us to see and it is beautiful, so um, we will um, now watch um, Welcome to the Circle to continue our, our theme of welcoming.
<laughs> uh, sorry, Lynn, I thought you were leading. Oh, um, I thought you were. <laughs> join, join, join us now in our uh, call to worship. Drawn by God's presence. We gather. Inspired by God's spirit. We worship. We worship. Empowered by God's grace. We live. Opened by God's love. We share. So I'm going to read about the loaves and the fishes from the point of view of a little girl called Anna. Many people walked a great distance over the hills to see Jesus. A young girl named Anna and her mother had left their home before the sun was up. As she stood on the hill where Jesus was teaching, Anna looked all around and could see people in every direction. It was like being in a sea of people. Anna felt lucky to be close enough to Jesus to hear his voice clearly and see his eyes. Anna had never before seen such eyes that held so much love. She felt her stomach growl with hunger. It had been a long day of walking. 
Anna looked over at the basket of food sitting next to her mother on the grass. There were fresh loaves of barley bread and two little fish Anna had caught in that basket. Maybe her mother would offer her dinner soon. Anna knew she shouldn't ask. That little basket was all they had until they went home again. She didn't know when that might be. As she was thinking about food, Anna suddenly realized the man called Philip was talking with Jesus about food too. Anna could hear the concern in Philip's voice as he said, even if we could buy bread out here, there's not enough money to feed all these people. Anna knew that was true. Jesus was poor like most of the people here. He probably didn't have enough food for himself, and he certainly couldn't take care of the huge crowd like this. Anna looked at the basket that held her dinner. There was just enough there for her mother and herself. That wouldn't be any help. But Anna knew she couldn't sit and eat dinner while Jesus and all the others went hungry. She ran across the grass to her mother and grabbed the basket. Leaning close to her mom's ear, Anna urgently whispered, Mother, Jesus needs food to feed all these hungry people. Can we please share the bread and fish you packed for us? Her mother looked puzzled, then a bit amused, and then smiling lovingly, she said, of course, give the basket to Jesus. Anna quickly carried the basket to one of Jesus's companions and boldly pulled on the man's rope to get his attention. The tall bearded man looked down at Anna with surprise, but he smiled gently and asked, what do you need, child? We want to share the food in our basket. Could you please tell Jesus that we have some food? Anna explained eagerly. The man immediately picked up the basket and moved closer to where Jesus sat on the high point of the hill. Master, a young girl has offered her dinner to share. There are five loaves and two fish in this basket, he announced a bit doubtfully. Anna was suddenly a little embarrassed to hear herself mentioned. Jesus smiled when he heard when the man, what the man named Andrew said. He instructed his disciples to reassure the crowd of people and tell everyone to sit on the grass. Then he took the basket from Andrew and offered up a prayer of thanksgiving. Jesus rose from his place and looked over at Anna. Anna saw those eyes of love again and didn't feel a bit hungry. Jesus walked into the sea of people with the basket in his hand and Anna ran back to her mother's side. After a time, the basket was passed to her mother who took out enough bread and fish for their dinner. The basket wasn't empty, so she handed it to a man who sat nearby. Anna lost track of the basket as she gratefully ate the good bread and salty fish. She noticed that everyone around her was eating as well. As the people finished their meal, Jesus spoke to them again, and Anna listened to his strong, gentle voice while the sun began to set behind the hills. The companions piled up baskets of leftover bread and fish at their teacher's feet. Anna could count 12 baskets, all full of broken loaves of barley bread and pieces of little fish like the one she'd caught. Anna couldn't figure it out. Did Jesus feed all the people out of her basket? Did others share their food so there was enough to feed everyone? She decided she didn't want to think about it too hard. Her stomach was full, but her heart, her heart was even more full of happiness. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Mark in the first chapter, beginning at the 29th verse. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, 
he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends the reading. Good morning. For those who may not know me yet, I am Jennifer or Jen, and I'm honored to be with you all today. After reading through this week's lectionary passages, I'd like to talk about miracles. But right now with COVID still raging, social divisions still glaring, and the end to all the madness seeming still so far off, it just feels like a Herculean task to speak of miracles. Now the Merriam-Webster dictionary defines miracle as an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. And while I'm not going to argue that definition, it brings up a whole host of questions for me right now. Questions of fairness and equity. On first reading, even our gospel passage makes me wonder if I'm to be honest. After healing Simon's mother-in-law, we're told Jesus was brought all who were sick or possessed with demons, all. The whole city showed up. Now, the author of Mark's gospel is a person of few words. This gospel is streamlined and compact, but goodness, could they not have at least clarified whether the whole city being gathered at the door meant there were the sick, the possessed, and the spectators gathered, or if the entire city was sick and possessed? Regardless, we learn Jesus cured many who were sick, with various diseases and cast out many demons. Wait a minute, what do you mean many? He was brought all who were sick or possessed and yet Jesus doesn't heal all, he only heals many? How is this fair? Sorry folks, but Mark's gospel has some explaining to do. Fortunately, there is an explanation. But before we get to that, let's talk about the purpose of the healing miracles Jesus performed as reported in the New Testament, shall we? Now, of course, there are multiple purposes for miracles in the Gospels, but a few include laying the groundwork of, for Jesus being recognized as the promised Messiah. There's Merriam Webster's notion of divine intervention. They're used as teaching moments, living parables, if you will. And of course, restoring people to their proper places. Today, I'd like to focus on the latter two purposes. So as most of us know, the healing miracles were not only about restoring people to physical and mental health. It was not enough to lower the fever do away with the coughs and sneezing, or even cure the lepers. Jesus knew that to relieve depression, stop the epileptic seizures, or bring stability to the mind of the schizophrenic was not enough. These were people who needed complete restoration. They needed restoration of their health. They needed restoration of their self-worth. They needed to have their place in society restored. And most importantly, they needed to have their proper connection with God restored. This was the work of salvation. But there are problems with miracles. I mean, when was the last time you tried to perform a miracle? They take time and energy and knowing how to make things happen. Jesus found the balance of energy. We read in verse 35, 
that after all the clamoring, he went to a deserted place to pray. Now, we don't know what he talked to God about, but we do know from this scripture, as well as several others sprinkled throughout the biographies of Christ, that he was not shy about seeking his own self-care. Jesus knew when he was drained and just needed time alone to recharge. Time, on the other hand, was elusive. Keep in mind, he hadn't healed all those gathered outside Simon's mother-in-law's home. There were just so many, perhaps even a whole city's worth. And it would have taken so much time, time that Jesus knew he didn't have if he were to get on with the business of being message proclaimer. And so Jesus turned this healing fest into a teaching moment. Now, let's back up for just a minute and read the beginning of our passage again. The author of Mark tells us in verse 31 about Simon's dear mother-in-law by saying that he, Jesus, came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. Now, this is not to say that the unnamed woman suddenly felt better and jumped to fetch the boys tea and crumpets. Remember, the author of Mark was not overly verbose. Instead, there is what my English professor called a conservation of words happening here, um, a skill that I never fully grasped. This gospel writer, however, knew the art of choosing just the right word in order to eliminate the need for expansion. And the Greek word he chose for serve held the same meaning as found in the first chapter of Mark when describing the actions of the angels in the wilderness during Christ's temptation. The mother-in-law began to serve or minister to those around her. Now, after all this, with Jesus taking a few minutes to recharge, Simon and companions hunt him down and admonish him that everyone is searching for him. Jesus replies that, nope, it's time to move on. The next town awaits, and I've got work to do there. Message to share. Yes, Jesus uses this as another teaching moment for his newfound band of married disciples. But what exactly is he teaching them? How to escape quickly when there are still folks who need to be healed and set free? How to ration care? No, I believe Jesus is showing his disciples how to account for time. We can almost assume that because Mark doesn't describe the disciples as being troubled by this odd refusal to stay and finish the work of miracles, that they understood this teaching moment, and most likely that there was more to the story that didn't make Mark's final edit. Indulge me, if you will, in some creative imagining of the lesson. Jesus may have said something like this. Look, Simon, guys, I know there are still a lot of people in need, but we need to get moving. Yeah, 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 I, I know, but Simon, don't you remember your mother-in-law? Okay, well, it will be just the same. All those many people who were healed and freed and released from their various oppressions, they'll carry on now, just like your lovely wife's mom. In our absence, they'll take over and finish the healing work in their city. We need to get to the next town and the one after that and the one after that. Because there's a whole world out there that needs a miracle or two. And I came to be their teacher and proclaim the message that they could know how to make things right. And oh yeah, guys, here's a teaser. In time, you'll do even greater things than I. Now, I'm not sure that the disciples quite believed that last bit yet, but they did agree to follow Jesus and continue onward. There's an old saying, an old proverb that says, to give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, and you fed him for a lifetime. 
It's attributed to Confucius. And just like many ancient wisdom sayings, it's become a bit trite with overuse and underappreciation. In recent Western history, there has been a revival of this term, but not for the better. Instead, it has been weaponized and used as a justification for withholding aid from those in need. We often hear now this phrase used against things like food benefits, healthcare for all, and most recently extended unemployment benefits. Now, without lingering on the political aspects of this phenomenon, I will point out the spiritual applications by stating what should be obvious. When people are oppressed, whether it be by disease, mental illness, racism, homophobia, classism, disability, or any other means that pushes people to the fringes of society, they are not in an optimal place to learn how to be part of the solution. It's hard for broken and disenfranchised people to perform miracles. Jesus knew this. He fed over 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Yes, ironically, Jesus gave them a man a fish because he knew compassion is an integral part of teaching. Now, Confucius was not wrong. And of course, self-sufficiency is never a bad thing. But Jesus knew that a hungry person will struggle to learn how to fish. Indeed, when we strip away the modern rhetoric that's attached itself to Confucius's wisdom, we can see that he and Jesus were actually of similar minds. What the Chinese philosopher was saying is that it's preferred to teach others how to elevate themselves out of life's mire. Jesus took it a step further and shows us the importance of elevating others once we ourselves are made whole. So let me return to the question I asked earlier. When was the last time you performed a miracle? Perhaps it was when you yourself fed the multitudes by participating in the Super Bowl food drive. Maybe it was when you comforted mourners by quilting a square or praying over completed quilts. It could have been just an hour ago as you gathered with others to begin the learning of how to dismantle racism. You participate in miracles every time you don a mask in public and make an appointment for getting your vaccines. Anytime we affirm that Black Lives Matter or that LGBTQ people are created in the image of God, when we welcome the stranger from foreign lands, and as we were so eloquently reminded last week, quench the thirst of women, regardless of their station in life, we participate in miracles and in the creation of new miracle makers. Yes, there are problems with miracles. And sometimes the whole thing seem, can seem unfair, but I don't believe we can blame the divine. The problem with miracles is that they are not God's job, not exclusively anyway. The problem with miracles is there are not yet enough miracle workers. And so I implore you, my friends, to continue the work of bringing people to wholeness and don't be daunted if you can't get to them all. Remember, even Jesus didn't manage that. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
so much. We are so blessed to have the, the Dunlop family and those beautiful videos that uh, Ruth and Lynn put together and um, just thanks and thanks to Lynn. We have many gifts in this congregation and as we uh, start our time of offering, I uh, want to focus on the offering of prayer. We have two more uh, prayer quilts that we are going to uh, bless today. And um, we're going to start with one for Darcy's friend. And, and Darcy, would you like to tell us a little bit, uh, remind us about your friend and then the prayers that she needs? Um, yeah. Hi, thank you. And this is just the most beautiful quilt. And I just wanted to thank um, who made this and all the love that went into it. Um, this is for my friend, very longtime friend, Athena. And um, her wife was killed in a break-in last week. And um, she, it was in Palm Springs. She can't even be there. She's at her sister's now. Anyways, um, I was able to um, sit with Ruth and, and do a lot of prayers and a lot of knots on these, but I have left some knots here for um, my church family. And I thought that we could just stop just for 30 seconds and just silent prayer. And if you wanna say a prayer out loud for Athena and, um, and those who knew Jen, her wife, who was the one that was killed, but if you just wanted to say a prayer aloud, and I will just knot the remainder of these knots. So that's my hope today. So feel free to unmute yourself if you want to offer a prayer aloud, or we can uh, join in some silent praying. I'd like to just hold Athena in compassion and love and um, her pain must be unimaginable, but um, I pray that she'll receive comfort and peace. Amen. Creator God, I pray that a peace that passes on Athena in this time, that nothing makes sense. And it's hard to even believe. Hold her close. Let her presence 
be near to you. May you just be near, near to Athena right now in the passing of her beautiful life. Sandy, I will hold this while you do the blessing. Please join me in this blessing. Oh, divine love. You granted Athena and Jen that love that they have for each other. And it is that strong love that's making this time so so much harder. We can't imagine the pain that she's going through. We can't imagine losing a loved one to violence. It's a pain not many of us know. But we ask that she, that Athena would feel your love and our love and the love she shares with Jen wrapped around her as she wraps herself in this quilt. May it be a reminder that she is never alone, that those who love her are with her and that her wife is with her in her heart, living forever and ever. May it bring her comfort and peace. May she feel your presence. Amen. We have another beautiful quilt that we're going to bless today. And this one was made um, for Ari Keister, Carrie's sister-in-law. Will you introduce her to us and her prayer? So I ask for prayers for my sister-in-law, Ari. Um, she and my brother met when they were 16. So she's been in my life most of my life. And um, shortly after turning 50 during a routine mammogram, they found cancer and um cancer for Ari is a little more significant because her mom died of cancer her aunts have died from cancer cousins have had cancer so there's just a long history and it's very scary and she'll be um in the very near future having uh going through surgery and then starting the chemo radiation uh treatments and so I just ask for prayers for Ari during this difficult time of healing, wholeness, you know, and um, I do want to say that there has been a blessing because they did some genetic testing and it does not seem to be the same cancer that um, killed her mom. So that we're, we're really um, thankful for. So thank you for your prayers. Even though these knots have been tied and prayers have been laid upon this quilt, I want to invite you to offer your own prayers as we take just 30 seconds or so. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to offer a prayer aloud or offer your prayers in silence.
Will you join me in a blessing for Ari? Great physician, loving healer, we ask you to bless this quilt that the prayers of so many may have a healing power for Ari. That she may feel your healing presence when she wraps herself in this quilt. We pray for the wisdom of her doctors. We pray for the success of her treatment. And we pray for her peace and comfort and strength as she goes through this challenging time. May our love and prayers gird her up, give her that strength, and may she feel your presence with her on this journey. Amen. Offering prayers is one thing that we do for one another as we walk together, as we heard in the welcoming song, that we walk with one another um, on this journey of life. And we walk with our friends and our loved ones. <clears throat> is the mission of United Church of the Valley to walk with people in need. Our, one of our mottos is no one stands alone. And if you would like to join us in this ministry through membership, please know that you are always welcome. Um, and although we don't ask every week, uh, please know that if you just contact Deb at admin at ucvchurch.org, um, we will uh, we would love to welcome you officially as a member into this community. If you would like to join us in ministry uh, with your donations, uh, you can do so. Um, and there'll be a slide, I think later, Darcy, but yeah, there we go. A slide of how you can donate to United Church of the Valley. If you want to help us maintain this prayers and squares ministry, which has touched so many people inside and outside of our church, please know that you can uh, mark your uh, donations on the memo line, prayers and squares, and we will make sure that your funds go to that ministry. However you choose to give, please know that you are giving to God to continue the work that together we, we are trying to do to make the world a better place and a more beloved community. Amen. And now we'll have our uh, more time of prayer with our joys and concerns. In a beloved community, People care about one another and share their joys, sorrows, and concerns with each other. We will do this by raising our hands to the camera so we can be called upon to speak. In a word or two, let us offer our thanksgiving and gratitude, our prayers for those we love within our community, and prayers for our world and all of its people. We will complete our prayers of the people time with a period of holy silence and then a prayer. When I say together we pray, we will respond with hear us, O oh God. I want to offer prayers for those who die alone and likewise for their loved ones who cannot be with them, particularly in this time of the plague. It happens so many times. God, bring them peace. Uh, we have Irene. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. I actually have joys um, that I'm so thankful and grateful for that I'd like to share. First of all, um, I'd like to uh, share with you that um, we did our um, ceremony with a judge on the phone and Soleil has permanently become um, a member of this family. She, after 10 years, she was adopted. 
and um, my baby is so happy. And so um, she's now Soleil Nicole Yamas Martinez. So, you know, just wanted to share that with you. Second is that um, we went to see the doctors um, for Shay and for William, actually, William and for John uh, uh, last Wednesday. And John's uh, hepatitis C is the medication is working. Um, we're hoping maybe one more month of medication and we won't have to worry about the hepatitis C at all. So thank you, Lord, for that. And the last one is uh, William. Um, William's uh, problem with his uh, feeding and the illnesses that he had uh, after, after before the surgery are gone. And he's actually swallowing and eating better. So that's a big plus as well. So thank you, Lord, as well. So thank you. Thank you. Any others? Donna, you had your hand up. Okay. Um, two things. My daughter-in-law's grandmother has taken a turn for the worse. So she's up in Tehachapi visiting with her grandmother um, this past week. So keep her in your prayers. And then the bright side is we had a camp meeting. Um, our outdoor ministry team had a meeting on Saturday for Pilgrim Pine. They are working so hard at keeping programs going up there. So watch for them because there's going to be family camps this summer. And we, we're hoping we can have family camps in pod groups up at, up at the camp as well as on the um, Zoom. And then there's going to be uh, something in May and something, you know, for next October. So just support camp, send money for camperships. I'm, I finished another quilt and they're $10, a, a raffle ticket, and that money will help camp. So a lot of people can get that feeling of being part of the church via the camp. Thank you, Donna. Kara? Um, I found out last week that one of my students, um, has leukemia. And, um, so he hasn't been in class all week and it looks like it's going to be about a six month process. Um, so I, just ask for prayers for him, for his body to be healed and, um, you know, getting through this process. He's got a great family um, supporting him. Of course, this has got to be super, super hard on him, but um, just prayer for um, the medicines to do their work and for his body to do its work and for healing for him. I care, thank you. Any other prayers? Oh, uh, Jamie? I'd just like to offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Um, I'm thinking of Jen and the beautiful message that you brought to us today. And then larger, all of the, the people who hold this group together um, throughout this this whole time, all of the people who do what do lead lead this part, the prayer of the faithful and the readings and the music and and um, and especially the those beautiful messages, which are just, it's, you know I didn't know Jen at all. It was just such a wonderful, pleasant, surprising gift, you know, to 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 hear that today, and and. Also to the, uh, just as I look at this, it's so nice to look at, it's strange to look at the screen. You know, when we're at church, I'm looking at the back of people's heads and I get to see people's faces and just these beautiful people, you know, people who live their lives um, just so compassionately. And it's just so, such, I'm just so grateful to be among you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Any other prayers before we close? I've got one real quick. Yes. <laughs> I have a prayer of just Thanksgiving that you guys are all here and that as I work, I'm able 
to hear a message, to be a part of a book club, to be just a part of this amazing group of people. Um, since December with the losses that I went through, my depression has been pretty rough. So I just asked for prayers um, for my mental health. I'm looking for an IOP program that will allow me to work on my depression and anxiety after work in the evenings. Because I'm working seven days a week, it's very difficult to find something that's virtual to keep me COVID safe. And then in the evenings as well, so that that would come to fruition is my prayer. So thank you. <laughs> we will join you in that prayer, Holly. Thank you. Anyone else? Steve, would you like to close this up? Together, let us share a moment of holy song. No matter how we understand prayer, we find that it is good to pray. Together, we hold these names and words in a spirit of prayer, a spirit of joy, a spirit of concern, a spirit of connection. For all these words shared today, and for all the words left unspoken, for all these, together we pray. Hear us, O God. And now, in one voice, please join in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples in your own most familiar words. Our beloved, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. like to invite everybody to now um, get whatever elements that you're going to be using for today's communion, have them in front of you, whatever little bit of something to eat and little bit of something to drink. Um, once you have those elements near you, I would ask that you just listen. And at the end, we will eat and drink together. He spoke saying, this is my body broken for you. Then he whispered in my ear, broken, so you know that I was breakable. And so you know it's okay to break as well. Broken, so that you will know that I was human. Broken, so that you can see that bodies are not always beautiful in the ways you think. Sometimes they are bruised and scarred. He spoke saying, this is my blood shed for you. Then he whispered in my ear again, shed so that you'll know the beating of my heart, shed so that you can remember the iron that's in all red blood and most red soil shed so that you will feel the warmth and know that I lived. He spoke saying, take, eat, and remember. His whispering went on, remember that I was broken too. Remember that I bled. Remember that I'm not broken anymore and I don't bleed anymore. And remember how very much alike we are. Remember. And now let us remember together.
Let us pray. Oh, wondrous and extravagant love that you are. Thank you for gathering us once again at your table, the table that is always filled with overflowing bounty, the table that welcomes everyone without exception to be nourished. We are indeed grateful. We are indeed your people. Amen. And now as we leave this space, this circle, may we continue the work of miracles. May we heal, may we bless, may we restore, may we create justice, may we love as God loves, amen.